First Love, 1860, Chapter 9, My Passion, Began With That Day. I remember that I then felt something of that which a man must feel when he enters the service. I had already ceased to be a young lad. I was in love. I have said that my passion dated from that day. I might have added that my sufferings also dated from that day. I languished when absent from Zinaida. My mind would not work. Everything fell from my hands. I thought intently of her for days together. I languished. But in her presence, I was no more at ease. I was jealous. I recognized my insignificance. I stupidly sulked and stupidly fawned. And, nevertheless, an irresistible force drew me to her, and every time I stepped across the threshold of her room, it was with an involuntary thrill of happiness. Zinaida immediately divined that I had fallen in love with her, and I never thought of concealing the fact. She mocked at my passion, played tricks on me, petted and tormented me. It is sweet to be the sole source, the autocratic and irresponsible cause of the greatest joys and the profoundest woe to another person. And I was like soft wax in Zinaida's hands. However, I was not the only one who was in love with her. All the men who were in the habit of visiting her house were crazy over her, and she kept them all in a leash at her feet. It amused her to arouse in them now hopes, now fears, to twist them about at her caprice. She called it knocking people against one another, and they never thought of resisting and willingly submitted to her. In all her vivacious and beautiful being, there was a certain peculiarly bewitching mixture of guilefulness and heedlessness, of artificiality and simplicity, of tranquility and playfulness. Over everything she did or said, over her every movement, hovered a light, delicate charm and an original, sparkling force made itself felt in everything, and her face was incessantly changing and sparkling also. It expressed almost simultaneously derision, pensiveness, and passion. By a love Zoroff, whom she sometimes called my wild beast, and sometimes simply my own, would gladly have flung himself into the fire for her without trusting to his mental capacities and other merits, he kept proposing that he should marry her and hinting that the others were merely talking idly. My Donoff responded to the poetical chords of her soul. A rather cold man, as nearly all writers are, he assured her with intense force, and perhaps himself also, that he adored her. He sang her praises in interminable verses and read them to her with an unnatural and a genuine sort of enthusiasm. And she was interested in him and jeered lightly at him. She did not believe in him greatly, and after listening to his effusions, she made him read Pushkin, in order, as she said, to purify the air. Lucian, the sneering doctor, who was cynical in speech, knew her best of all, and loved her best of all, although he abused her to her face and behind her back. She respected him, but would not let him go, and sometimes, with a peculiar, malicious pleasure, made him feel that he was in her hands. I am a coquette. I am heartless. I have the nature of an actress she said to him one day in my presence. And tis well. So give me your hand, 
and I will stick a pin into it, and you will feel ashamed before this young man, and it will hurt you. But nevertheless, Mr. Upright Man, you will be so good as to laugh. Lucian flushed crimson, turned away, and bit his lips, but ended by putting out his hand. She pricked it, and he actually did break out laughing. And she laughed also, thrusting the pin in pretty deeply and gazing into his eyes while he vainly endeavored to glance aside. I understood least of all the relations existing between Zinaida and Count Malevsky. That he was handsome, adroit, and clever even I felt. But the presence in him of some false, dubious element was palpable even to me, a lad of sixteen, and I was amazed that Zinaida did not notice it. But perhaps she did detect that false element, and it did not repel her. An irregular education? Strange acquaintances? The constant presence of her mother? The poverty and disorder in the house? All this, beginning with the very freedom which the young girl enjoyed, together with the consciousness of her own superiority to the people who surrounded her, had developed in her a certain half-scornful carelessness and lack of exaction. No matter what happened, whether Vonifati came to report that there was no sugar, or some wretched bit of gossip came to light, or the visitors got into a quarrel among themselves, she merely shook her curls and said, Nonsense, and grieved very little over it. On the contrary, all my blood would begin to seethe when Malevsky would approach her, swaying his body cunningly like a fox, lean elegantly over the back of her chair and begin to whisper in her ear with a conceited and challenging smile while she would fold her arms on her breast, gaze attentively at him, and smile also, shaking her head the while. What possesses you to receive Malevsky? I asked her one day. Why, he has such handsome eyes, she replied, but that is no business of yours. You are not to think that I am in love with him. She said to me on another occasion, No, I cannot love people upon whom I am forced to look down. I must have someone who can subdue me, and I shall not hit upon such an one, for God is merciful. I shall not spare anyone who falls into my paws. No, no. Do you mean to say that you will never fall in love? And how about you? Don't I love you? She said, tapping me on the nose with the tip of her glove. Yes, Zinaida made great fun of me. For the space of three weeks I saw her every day. And what was there that she did not do to me? She came to us rarely, but I did not regret that. In our house she was converted into a young lady, a princess, and I avoided her. I was afraid of betraying myself to my mother. She was not at all well disposed toward Zinaida and kept a disagreeable watch on us. I was not so much afraid of my father. He did not appear to notice me, and talked little with her. But that little, in a peculiarly clever and significant manner. I ceased to work, to read. I even ceased to stroll about the environs, and to ride on horseback. Like a beetle tied by the leg, I hovered incessantly around the beloved wing. I believe I would have liked to remain there forever. 
but that was impossible. My mother grumbled at me, and sometimes Zinaida herself drove me out. On such occasions, I shut myself up in my own room, or walked off to the very end of the garden, climbed upon the sound remnant of a tall stone hothouse, and dangling my legs over the wall, I sat there for hours and stared, stared without seeing anything. White butterflies lazily flitted among the nettles beside me. An audacious sparrow perched not far off on the half-demolished red bricks and twittered in an irritating manner, incessantly twisting his whole body about and spreading out his tail. The still distrustful crows now and then emitted a caw as they sat high high above me on the naked crest of a birch tree. The sun and the wind played softly through its sparse branches. The chiming of the bells, calm and melancholy, at the dawn monastery was wafted to me now and then, and I sat on, gazing and listening, and became filled with a certain nameless sensation which embraced everything, sadness and joy and a presentiment of the future and the desire and the fear of life. But I understood nothing at the time of all that which was fermenting within me, or I would have called it all by one name, the name of Zinaida. But Zinaida continued to play with me as a cat plays with a mouse. Now she coquetted with me, and I grew agitated and melted with emotion. Now she repulsed me, and I dared not approach her, dared not look at her. I remember that she was very cold toward me for several days in succession, and I thoroughly quailed. And when I timidly ran to the wing to see them, I tried to keep near the old princess, despite the fact that she was scolding and screaming a great deal just at that time. Her affairs connected with her notes of hand were going badly, and she had also had two scenes with the police captain of the precinct of, one day, I was walking through the garden, past the familiar fence, when I caught sight of Zinaida. Propped up on both arms, she was sitting motionless on the grass. I tried to withdraw cautiously, but she suddenly raised her head and made an imperious sign to me. I became petrified on the spot. I did not understand her the first time. She repeated her sign. I immediately sprang over the fence and ran joyfully to her but she stopped me with a look and pointed to the path a couple of paces from her. In my confusion, not knowing what to do, I knelt down on the edge of the path. She was so pale, such bitter grief, such profound weariness were revealed in her every feature that my heart contracted within me, and I involuntarily murmured, What is the matter with you? Zinaida put out her hand, plucked a blade of grass, bit it, and tossed it away as far as she could. Do you love me very much? she inquired suddenly. Yes. I made no answer. And what answer was there for me to make? Yes, she repeated, gazing at me as before. It is so. They are the same eyes, she added, becoming pensive and covering her face with her hands. Everything has become repulsive to me, she whispered. I would like to go to the end of the world. I cannot endure this. I cannot reconcile myself. And what is in store for me? Ah, oh, I am heavy at heart. 
My God, how heavy at heart. Why? I timidly inquired. Zinaida did not answer me and merely shrugged her shoulders. I continued to kneel and to gaze at her with profound melancholy. Every word of hers fairly cut me to the heart. At that moment, I think I would willingly have given my life to keep her from grieving. I gazed at her, and nevertheless, not understanding why she was heavy at heart, I vividly pictured to myself how, in a fit of uncontrollable sorrow, she had suddenly gone into the garden and had fallen on the earth as though she had been mowed down. All around was bright and green. The breeze was rustling in the foliage of the trees, now and then rocking a branch of raspberry over Zinaida's head. Doves were cooing somewhere, and the bees were humming as they flew low over the scanty grass. Overhead, the sky shone blue, but I was so sad. Recite some poetry to me, said Zinaida in a low voice, leaning on her elbow. I like to hear you recite verses. You make them go in a sing-song, but that does not matter. It is youthful. Recite to me, on the hills of Georgia. Only sit down first. I sat down and recited, on the hills of Georgia, that it is impossible not to love, repeated Zinaida. That is why poetry is so nice. It says to us that which does not exist, and which is not only better than what does exist, but even more like the truth, that it is impossible not to love. I would like to, but cannot. Again she fell silent for a space, then suddenly started and rose to her feet. Come along. My Donoff is sitting with Mama. He brought his poem to me, but I left him. He also is embittered now. How can it be helped? Some day you will find out, but you must not be angry with me. Zinaida hastily squeezed my hand and ran on ahead. We returned to the wing. My Donoff set to reading us his poem of the murderer, which had only just been printed, but I did not listen. He shrieked out his four-footed iambics in a sing-song voice. The rhymes alternated and jingled like sleigh bells, hollow and loud. But I kept staring all the while at Zinaida and striving to understand the meaning of her strange words. Or perchance a secret rival has unexpectedly subjugated thee, suddenly exclaimed Maidanov through his nose, and my eyes and Zinaida's met. She dropped hers and blushed faintly. I saw that she was blushing and turned cold with fright. I had been jealous before, but only at that moment did the thought that she had fallen in love flash through my mind. My God, she is in love.